start the recording now. So without further ado, it's over to you, Dominic. Thank you very much. So if you just all bear with me while I uh, share my screen, I've posted in the chat. If you could just let me know what brings you here? What are you trying to, what are you hoping to get out of the session? I'll keep an eye on the chat while I'm doing the sharing thing. And uh, also, so they're just going to know what it is that you're expecting. So uh, also, if you'd like to uh, tweet at me, uh, you know, feel free to do it with at TechCheck at any time. But of course, you can also comment in the chat. Unfortunately, because of the way my screen is set up, I won't be able to keep an eye on the chat while I'm presenting. But I'll. Uh, I'll certainly sort of come back for the question Q&A session. If there's anything urgent, uh, I think Martin's here as well. So do jump in and let me know uh, that, uh, that I need to pay attention to something along those lines. However, uh, at the moment, I am looking at the chat. So do let me know in the chat, what is it that you're hoping to get out of this session? What brings you, what brings you here? So I saw, uh, I saw somebody was uh, attracted by the uh, useful approaches part. Well, I hope it will be it will be useful uh, approaches. I'm, <laughs> I forgot. I, I promised useful. Oh gosh, that's no, that, that's too much pressure. This was intended to be a, a workshop, an hour long work, workshop. And but as as these things change, change, it just got made into a, just a presentation. So so some of the very very useful things I probably you won't have time to do you know to do stuff hands on. But hopefully there will be interesting stuff uh, there as well. And uh, I like the question about being able to design more purposefully because that's definitely something I want to uh, 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 want, want to sort of think about. So, so that's kind of that's where we are. So, thank you for letting me know. So, uh, what is it that I'm hoping to get out of this? Um, out of this, why are we even thinking uh, about what's called the user experience or a UX? And I think there are just there are really many lessons out there. Uh, if we look at the literature, and I've been sort of going down this rabbit hole recently of about how is it that users interact with interfaces in different environments, and what it actually means for for a lot more whole lot of interactions that you could go beyond just a simple uh, simple uh, you clicking on buttons and things like that. The whole sort of learning environment. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I'd like to run, ask you a quick question. Do you agree that computers should be easy to use, have intuitive interfaces? so that the user shouldn't need a manual or a training to understand those interfaces. So let me just quickly put up a poll and see if you if you agree with me. So um, and uh, so click yes if you agree and no if you don't agree. So the poll has is running now. So I'm getting uh, and if you disagree, let me know why in the chat because I'd definitely like to know about that. And uh, so we were so far we're seeing overwhelming agreement with that, um, and with that statement. Um, I don't know how many people we have six times, but most people have voted, and we have we have uh, huge people in fame in favor, uh, and uh, only three people have disagreed so far. So let me start, let me start the poll. But I actually agree with the people who said no, and because. What if you replace the word computers with cars? You know, what if you say cars should be easy to use and have intuitive interfaces that their users shouldn't need a manual or training to understand? Well, I think computers are much more powerful and in many ways much more useful than cars. And and uh, many people we sort of try to think that uh, they should we shouldn't need any sort of training or any any way of thinking about them to make them uh, to make them work. So I am uh, actually I don't think the intuitive is the right way to think about this. And, and hopefully I'll convince you of some of these. Uh, of this a little bit by the end, and I'll, I'll have some interesting examples you as as well uh, that will make this uh, more uh, hopefully make more sense. So I think for me the key lessons from things that I have as I've been reading the literature on design and, and looking at design issues myself, there is actually no such thing as a perfect or intuitive design. Using an interface is always a process of learning. It's not. It's never something that you just go to and and use without any thinking. And it's all the whole design is a process of discovery of the learning that is required. So those are I would say so of the key lessons that I would suggest are relevant uh, here. And uh, I would like to talk about the six areas uh, of uh, six concepts that I have learned over the past uh, year or, or or two of being more closely involved with the. Um, user experience design literature, 
and uh, they are affordances, the question of the knowledge gap, uh, idioms, uh, the difference between intermediate versus beginner users, uh, usability heuristics, and finally something that I've sort of tried to use as a synthesis of some of these lessons called zone of proximal capabilities. So what are affordances? Affordances, I think, uh, get thrown around a lot in the in 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 uh, the digital learning sphere, but uh, but I think people don't really often think about them very uh, deeply enough or carefully enough. So the definition, this is my definition that I would define as it's a property of an object that allows the user to interact with it in order to achieve a particular goal without conscious deliberation. So that's it's the sort of thing that allows you to grasp a handle, for example, a mug or pour, uh, you know, to use the mug to uh, to get some water out of a out of a bigger container. I wrote a lot more about affordances in the companion post to this talk. Uh, it's on the alt side, so so do do have a look there. So, a few examples here. Uh, the, the term affordances was uh, introduced uh, into the literature by Don Norman in the design of everyday things, which was originally called the psychology of everyday things. And it comes from this area called ecological psychology that was very much interested in how people interact with objects. So something like a door handle is, an is often given as an example of an affordance. You, know, you, 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 it's, you, know, you can grasp it, you can easily pull or, or push at it, you can plan to make, make, just, uh, make it things with it. Uh, and actually, the, from Norman's work, uh, there's this new meme has sprung up on the internet called Norman Doors, which is doors, pictures of doors um, that do sort of suggest different things through their affordance as they so pretend they can, that you can push or pull, but actually you can't, you can't do it as, as they would suggest. Um, because Norman said famously that, that um, you should never have to put a sign on it or it's push or pull. And uh, this is an example that's not from a Norman door, but it's 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 recently come up on the on the Reddit um, subreddit of crappy design, and this is from a um, an American distillery. Uh, their new sanitizers that are helpfully put into bottles that uh, just invite you to drink. So everything about this is, is to be grasped with your hand, the cap unscrewed, and then and just put it just to your mouth. So it's it's very much something that. That that is very natural. The, the most natural thing about it is to drink from it. Whereas, of course, what they what they try to do is they say, "Do not drink on there." But uh, I doubt that um, that that is a very handy. <laughs> that is enough, and and I suspect that there may be some people who will occasionally uh, take a sip. And but Norman also talks about uh, some really good examples of of design. So, for example, this is our doors. And if you think about it, when, when was the last time you came up to a new car, a like friend's car, and you didn't know how to open the door from the outside? So that so so obviously there's something done well. There's perfect affordance of the, the handle kind of works very quite nicely with the, with that. But Norman also points out that nobody's quite figured out how to do the internal doors right just yet because uh, uh, I've had many experiences of being in somebody else's car and not knowing how to get out because all of these little latches and locks and everything it all works differently. Sometimes you have to push, sometimes you have to pull. And, and it doesn't have any sort of intuitive way uh, of of interacting with it in order to open the door. So, so I would say that actually the Norman door issue is not quite resolved because sometimes it's just it's just too complicated. So uh, I don't know why nobody's figured it out to do it and to make it sort of make the affordance door opening door in cars, but nobody's done it. But it's an example of a Norman Norman door that, that suggests both that you pull it and push it. Uh, so, so this kind of an example of the affordances kind of going against giving you mixed signals here. Uh, but of course, what we often forget when we think about affordances, sometimes the affordances are uh, there for hidden uh, needs. So sometimes you may use this handle to close the door and this one to open the door. So, so I, you know, I would say, I always like to say that you can always push at a pull door. But to, to bring it back to Mr. Home, so these are some affordances. This is uh, from an old, um, uh, old conference I was at some years ago. And so obviously we have this nice printed schedule. So that's this nice great affordances of me being able to see all, everything side by side, uh, a circle of things that I want to attend. But of course there's an affordance of uh, the, the digital schedule has its own affordance. So I can, for example, scroll, I can I can search, but I cannot see things side by side. So that's, that's an, a disadvantage. So, so that's, um, and as we can see with the search, it also has to be sort of mediated by my knowledge about being able to do that. Now, another interesting example that's very relevant for education is is ebooks. So I've noticed that as I'm reading things on the Kindle and I'm sort of reading just sort of 
uh, uh, genre fiction that I'm not that interested in, just something to pass the time, then I often don't know what is the title of the book or what the what the uh, what the name of the author is. Because when I pick up a book, I see uh, I, I see the uh, the title. The affordance of the book is to present the title and the author always every time I pick it up. Whereas I pick up the Kindle, I don't see any of that. I just see the text when I pick up the Kindle. So I don't have that sort of reinforcement. But there are many many other differences. Um, on uh, many other differences when it comes to this, um, and I'll, I'll mention some more about how you how you how you leaf through the books, how you find information, how you met. The, so the paper has certain affordances that are kind of natural that the Kindle has to imitate that it doesn't have. And we when you forget about them, then we so we often make mistakes, such as suggesting that people can learn from digital textbooks in the same way they learn from paper textbooks, and 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 that's not always true. Another example of, of affordances of, of the digital space that people are in is that I've, I've had one uh, person said that, why don't people laugh at my jokes in a webinar? And that's just because they're not sitting next to each other. So they cannot see, they cannot feed off each other's perception because they're not getting everybody else's, else's chance so on. But also, as I also mentioned, it's important to also bring in the question of mental models into our affordances. And that's this, this, this brings me back to the, uh, that brings me back to the, uh, the question of the Kindle. So for example, it took a good 10 years for Amazon to introduce in the Kindle a way that you can jump between chapters without losing your place, and which is something you can very easily do in a book. You can open a book, quickly flip to, to the right page. That's actually quite hard on a, uh, on a Kindle. And with a textbook, you do it all the time. You want to you jump back to the indices, you jump back to uh, a chart that you're referring to all the time. And on a Kindle, that's quite hard to do, which is why Digital textbooks are not quite always as useful uh, as novels, as, as fiction, and so so it took quite a long time before Amazon before Amazon sort of made it easier. But even so, you have to have some sort of a mental model of what it is, what what is happening when you flip between those pages, and it's not at all obvious. So the the, the printed book is replicated in the digital space, but requires some sort of a mental model for people to to work through. So, so that is that I think is the lesson of, of affordance. It's it's a way of thinking about ways that aren't feel natural to us, even though they may be learned, but they feel they're immediately obvious that we, what we can do with it. And most of our digital interfaces don't have a natural affordance. We always have to do something to create some mental model to bring people to where we want them to be. And uh, and this is the uh, and, and this brings me to the next lesson, which is the knowledge gap lesson. And this is actually uh, this comes from a, a, the work of a of a, of a user experience designer, Jared uh, Spool, and it's uh, he talks about the intuitive design not actually being the the right goal, and and, and so Jared Spool talks about. Uh, the the fact that intuitive is not really a good thing to think about because what it's what uh, we're really talking about is what he calls a knowledge gap. So we need to look at the design's knowledge space. The knowledge gap is the space between what the users already know and what they need to know to be able to perform the action. And you never are you, an intuitive would be where there is no gap, but actually that almost never happens. That is a rare occurrence. So you always need to have some sort of a way of bridging the knowledge gap. And so that's something, uh, and that is what school calls the, uh, the biggest design, the biggest challenge is to actually know where the user's uh, knowledge is and what the target knowledge points are. And then we can either simplify the design to make less target knowledge required, or we can put in, we have to put in training or, or instructions and, and so on. So you can, uh, you, you can, you can see, uh, you, you can see, you can see um, um, some, some, some ex examples of that, of, uh, of, of how the, the mental models, current knowledge of the users, uh, users interacts here when you compare different versions of timetables. Uh, so this is, for example, the Oxford uh, to Heathrow timetable that tells you uh, that tells you how often the bus because it gives you the whole picture of the of, of where buses go and that is sort of takes into into account the fact that the users may want to know have a bigger picture of how often do buses go to Heathrow but if you want to just travel between Oxford and and the village where I live you actually don't have anything like that you just have to search your timetable and then you, you know exactly when the next bus is which is very useful which is a very useful thing to do but it never tells you but you have to do a lot of searches before you figure out how often the buses go there so in some ways uh, the designers of the system were not really thinking about all the things that I need that I need to know very often I need to have some example, have to, the knowledge that I have is in the form of some sort of image schema or script. So this is, this happened just the other week when Microsoft introduced this together mode in Teams. And what happens is that when people turn on the, the together mode, it gets a little checkbox next to it. And I was sitting in a meeting with a bunch of other learning technologists and one of them said, how do I turn off the to together mode? 
And uh, what they were doing was trying to tick the together mode again and untick this little tick box that Microsoft puts there quite unhelpfully. But actually, the mental model you need to know, need to have, is that you're switching between modes. Gallery mode is also a mode. Art gallery mode is a mode. So you're switching between them. So it's it's not a it's not a tick box. It's a toggle. But Microsoft has this sort of very unhelpful tick box here. So I, and that's happened to two people that I know about who had that 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 trouble uh, a struggle. And their, their response to that was, it's not very intuitive. But if you have the right model, it's perfectly intuitive. If you have the right target knowledge. But but here Microsoft doesn't help people acquire that target knowledge because the designers already have had that. The same, this, this, the very same thing is happening here. This very platform we're using right now. So click on somebody's picture. It will it will come up and, and become full screen. And then my slides will become this little, little small thing. But how do I then get the slides back? And my in, initial intuition was to click uh, to for the close button. How do I close this picture? Because they, but I had to realize I had to switch my mode to say I actually need to toggle back, uh, and I need to cl click on the uh, click on the the slides to bring them back to the front. So that's that's again sort of. Uh, I could figure it out quite easily, but it required there was some sort of source knowledge and target knowledge. It's this very same platform. Uh, um, how do I? It's not quite that easy to figure out how to share my screen because I am used to having that as part of my turning my camera on, turning my microphone on, and sharing my screen. Whereas here, the share screen is is hidden away. So again, uh, it's not very difficult to do, but it's it's uh, it required. My, cur my the current knowledge that I have, which is that usually the screen is here, uh, ha I had to work against that because actually the target knowledge was it's it's over here, and and the system didn't do anything to help me with that because it just it just assumed it's obvious, but but it, it but it isn't. There was a sort of a gap in knowledge. So that's uh, so so that's the sort of thing we need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention to uh, to uh, also other solutions. Um, that, that exists out there, so we can learn from them. And also, what's uh, called the what I'm calling the logistical space, and how many clicks it takes to, to get something sim simple done, and that, that's often quite difficult. So, another uh, one more lesson that I want to that I want to share from the, the learning so far is that uh, we often we should privilege idioms over metaphor. So, so there, there's this sort of a lesson that idiomatic design is better than metaphor-based design because there are not enough metaphors. Let's see, let me give you some examples. It comes from a book by Alan Cooper uh, and his colleagues from the uh, the, uh, the Cooper Design Agency. It's called About Face, but it has lots of great ideas. And they say, well, we're often that design should be sort of metaphorical, which means it should reflect some things we already know. So this is from a very early uh, Apple advertising when they were introducing their the early Mac uh, Mac Macintosh system, uh, and they had these they were as part of their promotion, they were showing these pictures. You know, so a calculator looks like a calculator, a folder looks like a folder, a trash can looks like a trash can. And, and they just had these analogs in the real world. So that was a very much a metaphor-based design. But there just are not uh, enough metaphors, uh, and you can overdo it. So for many, many years, I, iPads and iPhones had the, what's called the skeuomorphic design. But that's not always very useful. Uh, so you can see the bookshelves here. And there's been a lot of pushback against that because it makes the inconsist interface inconsistent across apps. It takes up a lot of space with distracting elements. There's not in, there are not re enough real world analogs. But so so that's uh, so that that I think another problem here is that metaphors presuppose shared knowledge uh, and shared mapping, and that often also doesn't happen. People so have some other uh, other uh, imagine different things under different metaphors, like we saw earlier. But idioms don't um, are a different piece. They don't make sense until you know what they mean. But they are quick to learn and they are quite sticky. So for example, words like kick the bucket, put me up for the night, this and that. Those are all idioms, forms of idioms. And if you just look at the individual words, they it may not actually make sense if you just translate them with the dictionary. But if you, once you learn what they mean together, they become quite intuitive and they're quite easy to use. Uh, and uh, and then so that's why we prefer idiomatic design. So what you're seeing here is Steve Jobs demoing Pinch to Zoom. So this is perfect example of idiomatic design. It's not a lot at all intuitive. There's nothing intuitive about uh, pinching on a photo to make it bigger. But Steve Jobs only had to show it once during the presentation, and everybody wanted it, and everybody immediately knew how to use it. So when people got iPhones, they didn't need any training on this because they just they already knew. It was so powerful and so easy to easy to learn. Here's another example of a, of an idiom that's developed, which is uh, this is a check. Um, a bus time table. And so you already you can look at it and you know the first one is where you say where you're coming from, where you're going to, and then here you're going to see some dates. Once you click on it, you're going to see dates. So it's a very easy example. Here's another example where you have the new idioms developed in, in, in checking where you where you do where you booking things. So you used to do you have to check them get these separately, but now all you have to do now is you have to just click there once and you click on the date first where you're starting and then you click on the second date. Uh, on where you're ending, and it's not at all intuitive. There's nothing intuitive about this, but you're getting lots of good feedback, 
And once you do it once, you just know how it works, and it's so very, so very useful. Uh, another example of idiomatic uh, design, which is not so great, is in Canvas. So those of you who use Canvas know this. And they decided to know to name the structure of the course modules, which is very unfortunate because uh, uh, modules mean something different at di in different institutions. It could be modules of a course. Sometimes a course is a module. Sometimes so it's very very confusing. However. Uh, it, it's not all that, con in reality, it actually isn't that confusing. It feels like it should be, but in reality, you just have to tell the students once, you know, we have these modules and there's this link that's modules in here. That's what it does. That's what it does. And it just kind of, it just kind of works. It's not something that remains confusing. So it's a sort of an idiom that, you know, it's not perhaps, you know, we're better if we wouldn't have to do this, but it, it actually kind of works. Here, sometimes the, uh, sometimes the idioms uh, can get confusing. So the, here's a, my old washing machine, which uh, has the, uh, when on is, button is out whereas uh, whereas when you when you when you turn it off you push you push the button in which again uh, is there's nothing into it it turns out that actually there's nothing natural about the on being push in but it's just uh, but it's, it's just a convention that's what the idiom is and they decided to go against that idiom so it's, so you can see that that's that, that's an issue and then, again we have the example of idiomatic design with the, the the switches here where you have the so red uh, red is showing up, but I never know actually which one it is. Is which one is on and which one is off? Is the red? To, do I need to push the red? A good example of the uh, of the uh, the Logitech clicker, which has you, you switch it to off, and then this red thing comes on. But then when you uh, switch it to on, you just slide back to the red, which is kind of very strange. So, so, so sometimes the sometimes these idioms may be quite quite difficult. So, so that brings me to the to the next one, which is the. Uh, which is the uh -huh. Just say we got a couple of minutes left. Oh, my apologies. My apologies. Okay, so let me just kind of finish. Is that is, is that what I'm going to say? Is that the last the last bit the last two bits? I would say that we should sort of aim design at intermediate users. And so one example of that is that is that people who use the uh, people who use the course all the time. So here's an example of a very common thing that happens on course designs, which is the uh, which is the very long introduction when you have a where you have a digital course. But actually, the users only ever need to be welcomed once. Uh, but so having just a welcome link would be much more helpful because then every time they come to a course, they still have to go through the welcome scroll away. So that's kind of the example uh, of how to avoid uh, sort of designing for beginner users. So it's not too many steps, long welcome messages, only one way to do things. Again, those are all for beginners. Uh, but there, uh, the other thing that I, I often see, design for the manager, something that somebody can, you know, somebody who only looks at something for a minute and they never actually have to achieve any tasks. So, so, you, so you try to make it look for them, but not actually useful for the users. So, you know, so designing for the managers. You know, very often the, the corporate software is designed uh, as uh, the that is bothered by people who will not use it. So I will skip this. So I just I wanted to sort of just draw attention to the UX heuristics. Uh, uh, that, uh, that I definitely highly recommend looking at that because just going through these ten usability heuristics and your designs can help you uh, can help you dis discover things and uh, and then uh, also laws of UX website which has the Jacobs law which is Jacob Nielsen's law is that, that most of the time you just spend their time on other websites so we should uh, we should sort of keep that in mind look at the other websites. Uh, and uh, we should also sort of pay attention to what people people do. Keep an eye on 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 the way people do things. So 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 I, I have I have lots of examples here, but I'm just going to to skip them. And uh, fi my final words here are about the what I would I would say consider the uh, consider the zone what I'm calling the zone of proximate capabilities based on the zone of proximal development from Vygotsky is that we need to think about what, not only what users are accomplishing on their own, but also what they're accomplishing with the help and you see all the time that people are using people are using things with the help of others and so here's my one example of that when i was doing teaching about zoom i never had to show anybody how to set the virtual background in zoom because they always already knew because they already asked somebody you know some of the basic stuff like screen sharing was much more difficult than setting the virtual background so that so again i, I have lots more examples but i'm going to going to skip them uh, and uh, just going to find the, my final words what i what i would suggest that we need to not, not just think about uh, not just think about the, the the design itself, but also uh, about, about how people are learning from the context they're in, the interaction with others, uh, and then making sure that the environment they're in is full of guides, not just help in the system, but also the things we're already doing, like local guide champions, but also the, in our messaging about the teaching and learning, we should always include maybe tips about how to use Canvas, how to use or their VLE and things like that. And and finally, my final words is that support rich environments are good for people with additional needs because everybody has a learning need when they're busy, tired, or new 
uh, in a language, culture, environment, or subject. And so we just never need, we can never really end at the design process. So my apologies for running a bit, uh, a bit late. Uh, no, uh, but, not a uh, problem. Not a problem. Thank um, you so much, Tom. Question, I do please. think. Yeah, we have got we have had a couple of questions. Um, so I'll just read out um, the first one. So it was, does idiomatic design lend itself to collaborative learning? Um, and I think that came in from Miles. Uh, well, I, I mean, the the idiomatic design really is is a is, it's it's. I think the the idea there is it's something that is is that is that goes against the idea of the intuitive design. You know, so that's I, I would say that's the. Uh, that, that's really the idea. So I'm not sure. So the collaborative learning is perhaps part of it, but it's it's really the idea is behind is not don't focus on making things intuitive. I think that's perhaps the biggest biggest lesson there is just try you know th think about how can people do this easily and do, achieve tasks easily and quickly, and uh, and how you can uh, and how you can create. Um, you know, and, and how you can create ways, again, going back to the knowledge gap, how we can create ways for people to actually acquire the idioms, how they how they can sort of quickly learn the, the design. So I'm not, I'm not sure if, if it quite overlaps with collaborative learning, but it uh, but it certainly is, is, you know, the collaborative learning, I think, is, is a big part of that. You know, we need to have students learning from each other as well, how they use things. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then just very quickly, and um, we've had a question from Taskeem, which is, uh, do you have any examples of how different groups or countries or cultures have different ideas of what is intuitive? Um, no. And Taskeem was thinking of keeping it left or keeping it right whilst driving or different alignments for different languages. Yeah. So yeah, just before before I've pasted in the chat, I've pasted a link to my presentation, which, which has all my examples that I had to skip. So you can include those. Little, there's a few videos there as well. So feel feel free to have a look at those. Uh, well, again, it goes back to the to the to the to current knowledge and target knowledge. So I don't think it's sort of inherently cultural, but it very much is. It very much sort of what is idiomatic is learned. You know, so it's the things that feel intuitive to one culture or unintuitive to another, just because of the way things are done. So, so obviously door handles are a perfect example because those, you know, in the UK you have those so sort of strange door handles that you have to you have to twist, whereas in, in Europe you have ones that you have nice handle, you push down and you open, you open, and it's a completely different set of affordances, different ways of doing things, and they both make sense. And they both have sort of different advantages and disadvantages. So that's that's sort of a, not perhaps a digital example, but uh, but there's I, I mean I have loads loads of examples. For example, the arrows at the beginning uh, in front of, of a roundabout in the UK they're incredibly confusing coming from the Czech Republic. I almost got into an accident because they point they they say turn left or turn right, but actually they mean turn right after the roundabout. So we have the first turn left on the roundabout and then turn right at the end. So you know so the arrow itself may be confusing unless you know the whole sort of context of everything. So so that's got some okay. examples but off the top of my head. Thank you. Well thank you so much. Um thank you for those questions as well at the end, uh, Miles and Tuskin. So if we could all use the clap function in um our emojis and say thank you very much to Don. Um, that would be absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, Dom, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be 